OPCA, for those who might be new to the call. Um, our mission here at OPCA is to lead the transformation of primary care to achieve health equity for all. And essentially how we do that is um, we support and provide technical assistance to Oregon's federally qualified health centers, which right now we have 33 statewide. And these clinics provide a full range of primary care services. Um, including mental health, um, oral health, medical, and mostly with the uninsured or Medicaid population. So because of this wide range of services and the populations that are served, the technical assistance we offer really extends to a variety of activities um, around learning from clinics, educating others, and working to influence health policy at the state and national level. Um, just a couple logistics about the call. So we do have 10 minutes of Q&A at the end of the call. Um, so feel free to type in your questions throughout the presentation. And we will try and get to those at the end um, or during the presentation if time allows. Um, and so just a little bit about the topic that we will be discussing today. Um, I want to provide you with a kind of at-a-glance review of what we'll be talking about. You should all have received an agenda, um, which covers it in a little bit more detail. But briefly, we'll be providing a quick overview of the Diabetes Poor Control CCO incentive metric. We will also hear from three presenters on topics rel uh, relevant to improving this measure, including a presentation from Aaron Kirk at OHSU. Um, Judy Sunquist, who's a registered dietitian nutritionist, as well as Amy Allen and Michelle Guerrero from Yakima Valley Farm Workers and the Rosewood Clinic. We have three learning objectives for today's call, um, mostly revolving around diabetes management and diabetic population management. So the first objective is really about uh, learning how PCPCH roles can improve di diabetic management. The second objective is to understand how nutrition impacts management of chronic diseases such as diabetes. And then we also hope that you're able to learn a little bit about a model for delivering nutrition services to enhance diabetic population self-management. And again, most of these topics will be covered by our guest presenters. And just quickly, I know that we're at the very tail end of uh, November, but November is Diabetes Awareness Month, so this is a great time for us to be doing a learning and sharing session on this. Just a few facts that I thought were really interesting. Um, that one, diabetes currently affects nearly 10% of the U.S. population, and it's estimated that one in three American adults will have diabetes by 2050. Um, also, di diabetes increases other risks. Um, including heart attacks, kidney failure, and blindness among adults. And it's estimated that the total cost of diabetes um, diagnosed in the U.S. is about $245 million um, per year. And direct medical costs are more than two times higher than that of other um, chronic diseases. So I just thought these were kind of interesting statistics that will leave um, lead into this call and let us kind of for us to keep in mind as we're going through as to why we should improve this measure and why it's really important to look at this and how it's affecting the populations that we serve. Um, so on the, the little picture that you see here is actually a link, so feel free to click on that later. It has a bunch more other facts if you want to research further. So um, I will be providing you the definition um, that OHA provides around diabetes for control. Um, there is a link to both the OHA definition as well as the UBS definition, um, which is on the link below. Um, so a little bit of trouble here. Um, the numerator for this, uh, for this definition is that patients who receive uh, whose most recent HbA1c level is greater than 9%. So that's the key for this measure, is that, that the level has to be greater than 9%. And so these patients in the denominator are those aged 18 to 74 years of age who had a diagnosis of diabetes. Um, the one exception to this 
denominator is that only patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes should be included. Um, so in other words, you don't want to include people in that denominator who may have type diabetes. Um, so again, just kind of reviewing this measure, um, this is kind of one of the inverse measures of the CCO incentive metrics where lower is better. So the lower percentage that you have on this is better. Um, and then I also want to note that there's a CCO incentive metric, metric benchmark change that's coming up. So in 2014 and 2015, the benchmark for OHA was 34%. Um, and then 2016, it's actually decreased um, by about 15% and is now, benchmark is now 19%. So that is a big jump that people are going to have to do uh, work towards for this incentive metric. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Aaron Kirk. Uh, she will be QC Quality Manager at OHSC Richmond, and she will be conducting an example of the practices around the um, OHSC Richmond is currently the only uh, community health center in Oregon that is meeting the 2016 benchmark for diabetes work control. So we can definitely learn a lot from them as to how they are working to meet that benchmark. Aaron? Before I start, um, I think we're all hearing some major feedback and background noise. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. It might. Oh, that sounds good. Why don't I go ahead and I'll go ahead and mute all the callers, um, except for you, obviously, and then see if that prevents it. Great. Great. Okay. So do I sound okay now? Yep. You sound great. Okay. And sorry, I, I had heard that, but I somehow my control panel screen disappeared, so I wasn't able to really do much about it. Oh, but it looks no like worries. It's yep. Now. Yep. Sounds great. Good. Okay. Let's All see. Right. And sorry. Oh, excellent. So whenever you're ready, Great. go ahead. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, hey everybody, I'm Erin, I'm the Quality Manager at the OHSU Family Medicine at Richmond Clinic. Going to start off with just talking um, a little bit about some of the history and background um, of the Richmond Clinic. Sorry, are you advancing for me? Yeah, just let me know when Sorry. you're ready cool. to go thanks. to the next yep. slide. Great. Um, so I added this because I thought it was funny. We had a site visit here about, oh gosh, a week ago, and somebody pointed out how we were probably one of the few FQHCs who are on a, kind of in an urban area located on what division is now dubbed as Restaurant Row. We've had such major growth here, so we're in southeast Portland. Our clinic is on the corner of 39th and Division, and there's been so much development in the area that many, many restaurants and shops have popped up, and so Bon Appetit and all these other, like Food and Wine magazines have been doing lots of restaurant reviews, so that was funny. So that's where we're located, on Restaurant Row. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, Let's see, we have two sites here on Division. Um, the Richmond Clinic is our patient-centered primary care home, and we have a walk-in clinic located two blocks up the street, um, which provides uh, just walk-in, not necessarily urgent care, but anything within our family medicine scope. But it is unique as it's co-located um, within Cascadia Behavioral health building where they also have urgent uh, walk-in mental health care. So that's been a great partnership. Um, our care teams consist of uh, PCPs, a nurse care manager, medical assistants, a behavioral health consultant, 
a team coordinator, um, which we dub our kind of back office admin person to the care team. And most recently, we have some clinical pharmacy uh, dedicated to each team. And we have four teams um, currently uh, in the clinic who are uh, providing care to over 12,000 patients annually. And sort of an average Richmond patient needs about four visits per year. Uh, since the ACA, we have, um, we're right around 60% of our population uh, having uh, the Oregon Health Plan and um, have always had a pretty high Medicare population at 20%. And uh, now just a small handful, less than 6% of uninsured, and the remainder are commercially covered, mostly OHSU um, employees and dependents. Um, Let's see, we have over 120 staff, and we're also um, a family medicine residency clinic. So we have 13 residents here who are permanent members of our care teams throughout their residency. So that they are PCPs to many patients and are a member of a care team, um, even though they're uh, rotating and having different experiences throughout their training. Um, they are assigned a panel here and are a Richmond provider. And we are also a um, Ocean Epic user. Okay, next. Um, our uh, history around our kind of how we've managed diabetes in the past and where where we got is um, it kind of was born out of a learning collaborative that um, we participated in that was helped along and really born out of a Care Oregon learning collaborative back probably before 2011, but really took shape. Um, in that year. And so that's when we decided to um, kind of standardize and focus what we today call diabetes care management. So it began with um, nurses taking on a, the role as care manager. Um, they provide standard education, coaching, um, to diabetic patients and then also can provide insulin titration by protocol as needed. Um, that work includes a heavy use of a diabetes registry which um, is currently uh, an OCHIN tool that's web-based called Acure. Some people might know it as solutions in years back. And the nurses also, though, track the patients assigned to them via patient lists in OCHIN. I'm uh, not a big expert in the use of patient lists, but it is an epic feature and could get more information if people are interested, but there are probably other people on the call who know much more about it. But it is a nice, what's nice about it is the nurses have their patient list right in OCHIN so they can track their patients and then um, get into the EMR, you know, right in that, in the OCHIN application where the registry is outside of OCHIN and so it takes some toggling back and forth that can be uh, frustrating but the registry is great for just overall tracking and uh, running reports. Um, See, we also um, began and continue ongoing CME for nurses on diabetes and related topics. This provides a lot of, um, well, job satisfaction for them because they feel uh, really well versed in what the kind of high demand needs are of the population. Um, and also since this time in 2011, we have tracked um, the rate of patient engagement, the number of coaching sessions um, that are provided to diabetes, uh, diabetic patients, and then their changes in A1C. Um, so we've been pretty, we have seen changes over time, but now have been pretty much um, plateaued at uh, 
having being right around 19% of the diabetic population with an A1C greater than 9, and those are the patients that get the most focus. And next. So um, this, we've been wanting, or have been working towards more segmentation of our population, but again, have this population that are the primary focus of our nurse care managers. So the patients who's A1C over 9, um, we're really lucky that we have some oversight and guidance provided by a nurse that we call our population health care manager. She has the ability to see different populations at more of a global level and not just at the care team level. So she directs a lot of our focus and work um, on impacting different populations. Uh, she's also able to co provide coaching and support to the nurses who are the care managers in the different care teams. Um, so I, I think all of that to say that a lot of the nurses' success, I think, are attributed to having a sort of mentor who is uh, guiding them and can provide um, a, quite a bit of support, as well as monitor the uh, performance and what's going on with different patients. Um, so another staple of our process is um, the, pro the provision of routine outreach to all diabetics. So this is a role that the team coordinators perform. They use the diabetic registry to um, troll for the patients who need to come in and perform the outreach process, which consists of first trying two phone calls. And if the patient can't be reached by phone to schedule, then a letter is sent. The majority of the time, the phone calls work, so that's been our kind of standard strategy. Richmond patients tend to respond well that way, or my chart, um, that's becoming more common. Um, but trying to uh, make a more personal phone call first seems to work. So the um, standard that they're using to perform the outreach is that all diabetics should be uh, coming to the clinic every six months or more frequency, frequently if their A1C is over eight. Um, those patients come in right around every three months and uh, have their A1C done at the time of um, their clinic visit. We're, uh, we do A1Cs at point of care, so um, the patient doesn't need to come in at a separate time or earlier that results available for use during the visit. Um, and then the other piece of sort of this monitoring process is that um, any diabetics who are lost to follow-up, uh, providers and nurses review the patients in their registries to determine who might be lost to follow up or try to figure out another way of um, understanding what's going on with the patient. Sometimes it's maybe a time limited sort of barrier somebody's experiencing or uh, they've gone somewhere else for a job, um, all sorts of things. So usually tracking patients and understanding their situation and uh, providing some guidance around if additional intervention is needed. Next. Let's see, so more on our process. Um, another uh, piece of just kind of the overall impacting the diabetic population is um, pre-visit planning that's conducted. So that um, includes chart scrubbing that our team coordinators perform. So they are looking for any gaps in care indicating when the patient is due or overdue. Um, and then also going out and looking for any labs um, or exams, procedures that a patient might have had done outside of the Richmond Clinic. So for us, patients are getting a lot of other services in the bigger OHSU system or even using, uh, they will use Care Everywhere to go look into other health systems to see if a lab or procedure was done elsewhere. 
and then they will update the patient's chart with that, uh, any information that they can track down. Um, and so after they have scrubbed the chart in um, preparation for the visit, the MA and provider, whom we call micro teams, huddle their, and review their daily schedule and identify uh, which patients need what during that visit and come up with a plan for how to address those things. Um, the MAs also are ordering A1Cs per protocol and um, run that test um, at the time of rooming and so results are available during that visit. And um, we also do a lot of monthly performance monitoring. So um, watching just that overall rate of diabetics with A1C over 9 is routine. But um, depending on what we see or our, you know, kind of understanding about what's going on in different processes, we will do different types of monitoring over a course of a year. Sometimes it's a chart review to be sure that um, these processes are happening the way that we um, design them to work, um, as well as, you know, everybody, every role, um, participating and um, conducting their piece of the process. So we're big on a lot of internal monitoring to understand our performance. Uh, next. Uh, so just a view since the beginning of this year of where we've been kind of hovering between the 18%. Looks like we've um, are pretty flat at around 19% of diabetic patients with A1C over 9. Next. And so these are some of the things that we've been thinking about lately in terms of not only maintaining our performance, but um, hopefully also getting a little bit better and then using what we've learned to apply to other conditions and just population health management in general. Um, so one thing that we have struggled with for a few years now is uh, just documenting and uh, understanding what um, should be part of a care plan. So having a consistent place to document it, understanding which roles should be engaging with a care plan, um, how often, how do they make updates, um, many of those things. I think that we are just about there. We have a care planning task force who has um, been spending gosh, about the last six months working on getting agreement on the consistent place of where they should be documented, also um, have constructed a dot phrase that should be used and some other kind of workflow things that support um, our participation in the alternative payment methodology uh, program. Um, we've also been struggling with um, the nurse's need for sort of carved out and dedicated time for care management. They've, uh, you know, many times they'll start their day with really good plans for how they're going to use their time. They'll carve out some time for when they're going to really focus on their care management populations and then everything else happens. So um, right now we are in a place where we are lucky to have a little bit more nurse staffing and have some time to um, have nurses cover kind of the daily work of the care team while the other nurse is um, either providing phone coaching or visits um, or just doing some registry and um, case review work. Um, we're also working on developing protocols for all staff involved so that we ha all have a better understanding of what, like kind of who does what um, and who, which roles can have the most impact or best impact where. So this is 
uh, going along with the work that we're doing around segmenting our population and working towards better definitions of when does nursing get involved and at what point uh, does a patient require more of a focus or intervention by a clinical pharmacist and then what's the role of behavioral health. Uh, next. So let's see. So sort of what I was just saying, we're, we're currently working on more of a population segmentation strategy. And that is we did start with diabetes just to kind of take a look at one population and determining what our criteria uh, would be for kind of tiering um, different levels of diabetics, but we're expanding that to our entire population. So with that information, our goal is to define clinical pathways that would um, work in this idea of which roles are providing what sort of intervention to which type of patient, and also to give everybody, including the patient, a better idea of kind of what to expect from whom and when. And we really hope that this work will make it so that we can have um, a little bit less oversight and management of this process. So I was saying earlier about how we've got this awesome population health uh, focused nurse care manager, um, but it is requiring a lot of hands-on support from her and constant monitoring. And we hope that by defining um, some more of this work, we can get her uh, kind of refocused in some other places so that it's not such a kind of handheld um, process at times. Let's see. Next, I can't remember if this was the last slide. Maybe. Um, we're about oh. five minutes over, though, so I'm wondering if you Oh, can sorry about that. No, that's okay. Um, are you okay if we save this for the Q&A portion course. and I come back to this? Sounds great. Okay, great. Um, so thanks for sharing all that. I, <clears throat> I really appreciated the process overview, which I think is sometimes one of the most critical components of, of the quality improvement piece, so that's great. Um, so I'll go ahead and move on to our second set of presenters and route back to this question um, at the Q&A portion. Um, so the second portion of the call will focus on nutrition services and diabetes. And we have Judy Sundquist on the line who will be presenting kind of about the overall impact of uh, nutrition on chronic disease management. Um, Judy Sundquist is a registered dietitian and nutritionist who specializes in nutrition programming and healthcare policy. Uh, she works with uh, CHCs of Benson and Lynn counties with the OHA um, Innovator Fellow Program. And so she will be talking about kind of the CCO perspective on nutrition services and again that chronic disease management aspect. And then we have Amy Allen, um, Nutrition Services Manager. All right, I have my control panel at this time. <laughs> and then we have Michelle Guerrero, who's a registered dietitian at Yakima Valley Farm Workers. And this is a um, federally qualified health center that operates both in Oregon and Washington. They have four primary care clinics in Oregon and see about 31,000 patients annually. So they'll be talking about how they use nutrition services to uh, help manage the diabetes population. Judy? You there? Yes. Can you hear me Great. okay? Yes, we can hear Great. you. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon on this very cold afternoon. <laughs> um, I'm happy to be uh, presenting some information um, about diabetes. Um, I really don't have a, that much time to get into all the nutrition management, but 
Um, let's move to the next slide and I will cover some very significant data. So um, our most current data for U.S. Uh, adults nationally is we have a lot of chronic health conditions. 50% of the population has one or more, 25% have two or more, and now we are at 10% of the population having diabetes. And of course, there's a, quite a large percentage that don't know that they have diabetes. Very significantly here also, about a third of uh, the uh, older population also has diabetes. So um, that clearly is a target population. Um, we haven't talked about um, pre-diabetes, but that is a condition that occurs prior to the overt diagnosis. And it is um, where uh, labs are showing a rise in uh, blood sugar or blood glucose levels, uh, slightly higher than normal A1Cs. Um, and it is something to be catching earlier because you can have a much better impact and possibly um, prevent the trajectory of going into uh, diabetes. So what is related and tends to be a very um, um, significant area for a lot of nutritionists is um, the indicator of, new, of obesity and overweight. So you're, you're probably hearing a lot of information um, in national press and certainly in the literature. We have 70% of adults that are either obese or overweight. And there's a very tight relationship with uh, diabetes and really other conditions. So this tends to um, uh, be seen quite readily in pre-diabetics and so is a very good indicator to start tracking and working with patients. Just um, the other thing uh, just to note here is um, 2015 new prevalence rates. They're seeing a 4% rise. Um, now 38% of women, uh, adults, uh, are obese. So uh, that is going kind of the wrong direction, basically. So just to kind of uh, provide this data and give you the sort of the enormity of the problem, because um, we're talking about FQHCs, also diabetes clearly has kind of a health equity issue. Diverse populations are more significantly affected. Um, the Hispanic and African American populations have almost twice the prevalence rate of uh, the white population. So <clears throat> we're, we're going to see diverse populations more significantly affected. Um, so uh, just again with this slide, it's just kind of showing the kind of continuum of chronic disease to rising rates of obesity and kind of precursors of, um, of diabetes. And really what's related to diabetes has to do with Nutrition, eating practices, exercise, stress. So that's the underpinning, really, for most of diabetes as well. Next slide, please. So modifying or preventing diabetes, obviously, we're looking to impact this metric uh, of an A1C greater than 9. And by the way, that is a really high A1C. So normal is 5.7. Um, so that's almost double of normal. So this is this is definitely a level of A1C where we're seeing lots of um, health consequences from that level of blood sugar, sustained blood sugar. Um, so on modifying and preventing diabetes, it because it is complicated, it's a metabolic kind of inflammatory condition that is progressive uh, if not addressed. Uh, and even if addressed, if it's not addressed well, it becomes progressive. So there are metabolic impacts um, that compound um, 
you know, from they kind of all add up, and it's from a number of controllable lifestyle factors. And so again, this is where nutrition comes into play. It's not only what somebody's eating, it's how they're eating, it's the structure and kind of um, daily process around eating, physical activity, sleep, and stress. So a lot of that has uh, biochemical, endocrine kinds of um, factors, and they all kind of compound and push us into disease states. So in terms of treatment, um, I think you heard some, uh, some great um, kind of uh, uh, approach from Aaron, but you know, we're, we're looking at what needs to happen if there's so much lifestyle factors that need to be addressed, and so much of it's kind of confusing, particularly in the area of nutrition. People are very confused about the nutrition label, how to eat, what to eat, what's the latest rage, um, much less how to eat for a particular condition. So it's a very confusing area, and it many times changes on them. Um, food changes quite a bit, and the environment around food changes. So in terms of uh, treatment, we're looking at kind of a synergy of clinical support services. There needs to be quite a diversity of support services, and they need to synergize. There needs to be enough dosing and variety of programming um, so that we're really getting patient engagement, their motivation, and kind of sustained impact. And so the idea here is really to engage the whole spectrum of patients, those clinically at risk, like the pre-diabetics, to those that are really high risk and also all throughout the lifespan. So it's children, gestational diabetics uh, during uh, pregnancy, and then of course through the adult years and senior years. Typically what um, you know, organizations and the literature showing is diabetes self-management education and support is really the best evidence-based platform because there's so many lifestyle um, aspects to this condition. Next slide. So um, our, the whole idea is to see if we can move the patient from um, hopefully an early diagnosis of diabetes to um, you know normal blood sugars and um, obviously there are key metrics for how to do that. I I'm going to digress just a little bit. Um, I'm talking also primarily about this type 2 diabetes uh, which is not the autoimmune type 1 version. Uh, the type 2 diabetes is a result of all those modifiable factors that I had mentioned in the previous slide and really affects about 95% of the population. So in terms of the diabetic registry for particularly type 2 diabetics, you're going to be looking at um, you know, what's already in your registries, which would be, you know, blood labs and blood sugar testing. Weight should be weight changes. There should be uh, some monitoring of that process. Should be some monitoring of what's going on with eating practices, understanding around nutrition and what has to happen with food. Uh, some understanding around physical activity and how to move some documentation around alcohol use, and also really some um, documentation around participation in programs. It would be great if there are a variety of programs uh, readily available for patients when they're at different points in managing this disease. They're going to need a lot of um, access points, so a lot of different programs that are approaching the disease either from, you know, nutrition or physical activity or glucose monitor, uh, monitoring, uh, foot care, whatever, a lot of different entry points for patients to get engaged. And um, bottom line is uh, the pre-diabetic area when patients are 
identified uh, with having some slightly abnormal blood sugar testing would be a great time to intervene. Um, they will not have those A1Cs of nine, but really in terms of utilizing clinical resources, you could really have a, a, a major impact with that population and turn it around. Okay, so um, uh, I'm not going to get into specifics around nutrition, but um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of information patients need to manage uh, what they're eating and how they're eating and, and how that affects their blood sugar. Um, and so I, I won't, I don't have time to get into all that, but there's a, a lot of work that patients and a lot of information um, that they need in that particular area. I'm, I'm going to move to the next slide and uh, with the limited amount of time here and talk to you a little bit about a survey that we did with CCO medical directors um, and Judy, really, I'm this is going to uh, briefly interrupt. I want to make sure that we have enough time for Amy and Michelle um, as well, and we're over time. So um, I quickly go through this, and we can maybe just flip through the slides. Just want to say that what we were trying to do with this survey is find out how nutrition services and if they're included and used well in terms of um, addressing chronic diseases. So next slide. So we did a survey in 2014, and um, we saw that um, medical directors really saw that uh, providing nutrition services would improve patient engagement, self-management, uh, long-term health. Next slide. And we also saw that the CCO medical directors felt that patient categories um, all of all the patient categories, the whole lifespan approach should be um, uh, should would be included in terms of um, accessing nutrition services. Next slide. And then in terms of priority can, uh, chronic disease conditions in particular, diabetes is right up there. As you can see, there are pri priority areas under consideration, and I'm sure diabetes is in that first uh, line there. Next slide. So in terms of strengthening nutrition services, um, we asked CCO medical directors what would be kind of process to do that. You can see that there's, um, it's identifying providers and resources and making sure models of care are available. Next slide. So just in conclusion, um, CCOs want to uh, reduce chronic diseases and meet their metrics. They do want innovative and effective models of care, which includes self-management, so nutrition services fit in that category. And um, they're interested in piloting and evaluating innovative areas. So um, that the inclusion of nutrition services on your teams really makes some sense to, to create some innovative approach. Um, I, I will end there. Thank you. Judy. Um, so I will go ahead and pass it on to Amy, Allen, and Michelle Guerrero from Yakima Valley so they can uh, discuss their model of care that they use within their clinic. Thanks, Akira. This is Amy, and I'm joined by my colleague Michelle, and she's at our Rosewood Clinic in Portland, and I'm in Yakima, Washington. And today we're going to talk a little bit about our innovative primary care nutrition services model and particularly how it relates to our diabetes self-management. Um, and like Judy's survey showed of C, uh, CCOs that they were interested in learning about other innovative nutrition models. So we hope that this gives an example of one. Go ahead and advance the slide. So we're with Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic and we have 19 medical clinics in Washington and Oregon and we serve approximately 140,000 patients annually. Uh, we currently have 13 registered dietitians across 15 clinics, and most of them are full-time. Um, regarding our patient population, about three-quarters of our patients are at 100% or below the federal poverty level, um, and then uh, most are on Medicaid or uninsured. And you can go ahead and advance. 
next we'll discuss our primary care nutrition services model. Next slide. As part of our efforts to improve self-management of chronic diseases and improve prevention of disease, we're reaching our patients as part of their regular clinic visit. So we're expanding the typical primary care 15-minute visit into a longer encounter, and we're doing this by utilizing the care team members, so for example, the registered dietitians or RBHCs, and regularly and frequently completing brief interventions. Next slide. And we're able to do this through an innovative nutrition model that we've adapted to the primary care setting. And compared to most nutrition models in primary care, ours significantly increases access to nutrition services for patients and providers. And it has been instrumental in helping our organization meet self-management measures for patients with diabetes. And next slide. So the next two slides compare the typical nutrition model in primary care with our model. And we also, um, just not too long ago, uh, followed the typical model. And it's only been really in the last few years that we've uh, fine-tuned our newer model. So looking at the first row, RD availability, we see that with the typical model, it's very limited. It's possibly one day a week, if that. And it's usually not at all sites in an organization. Compared to our model, we have mostly full-time RDs. Um, are these registered dietitians at every primary care clinic. Accessibility, it's typically a long wait for available appointments um, and therefore usually only the most urgent patients tend to be referred. With our model, we have same day access before or after the visit with the provider. Um, the typical model is usually all scheduled appointments, whereas ours is mostly warm handoffs to allow access, the same day access. And then the counseling style in the typical model is usually a complete nutrition assessment with a food recall, um, extensive nutrition education, a treatment plan that consists of several goals, uh, whereas ours uses motivational interviewing, an abbreviated assessment and education based on the patient's priority, and we're setting maybe one to two goals. Um, and because it's abbreviated, our appointment length is about 15 minutes on average compared to the 60-minute typical um, appointment. And patients seen per day, of course, would depend on your no-show rate. When we were following the older model um, at 60 minutes per patient and about a 50% no-show rate, we were seeing about four patients a day, uh, whereas now we're seeing um, around 15 patients a day. Next slide. So continuing this comparison of the typical model versus our model, in terms of identifying patients in the typical model, the RD would only see patients on their schedule who were referred by their PCP versus our model where we're really proactively identifying patients to see. We're using reports and registries. We're doing huddles with the care team and different um, screening tools to really reach the patients um, who we can help. And then in terms of integration, it's really non-existent in a traditional nutrition model. The dietitian is typically in a separate office and is very separate from what's happening in the clinic and happening with the providers. In our model, we're fully integrated. We're co-located with other care team members, and we're very active in um, clinic meetings and clinic activities. And then in terms of the role of the RD, in a typical model, the RD would be providing medical nutrition therapy to patients with only the most urgent chronic conditions. So, um, you know, your patient with diabetes is wildly out of control, that kind of thing. Versus our model where we're really trying to be accessible for as many patients as possible. So we do provide medical nutrition therapy. Um, we provide self-management to patients with chronic conditions, healthy lifestyle coaching, for counseling for prevention of diseases. And we also participate in community outreach events and in interdepartmental collaboration. Next slide. So here are a few um, quotes that are um, from about patients from some of our dietitians. So the first is from Diana. She's one of our dietitians. She's at Valley Vista in Prosser. So. Um, uh, MD referred a patient of his to me to work on improving her A1C, which was 10.2 when I first met her. 
she was very frustrated and overwhelmed, so we worked on one thing at a time, starting with ideas for a balanced breakfast. I met with her every time she came to see her PCP, and she was very appreciative of that. Within just two months, her A1C dropped to 7.7, .7, which her PCP was thrilled about. Her most recent A1C was 7.2 a couple of weeks ago, so she's maintaining the improvement. And then another quote from Josie, who's one of our dietitians in Portland. A provider just shared that her patient's A1C went down from 6.9 to 6.6 .6 with lifestyle changes alone. The provider said, and it wasn't me who did that because I didn't give her any medication. Guess who it was? It was our dietitian. So though we're moving in the direction of collecting data and objectively showing impact, for the last few years it's been this kind of anecdotal data from patients, providers, and administrators that's helped us grow as a program and become integrated into the care team. It's clear that our warm handoff model, our proactive approach to seeing patients, our motivational interviewing training, and our expertise in nutrition is helping our patients improve their health. Next slide. And then this is a quote from Natalie, who's one of our providers and our clinical lead at Rosewood. Um, we're lucky to have registered dietitians available for our patients. Our office is able to provide a service at every visit that so many others would have to wait for through a referral process. Our RDs have been an excellent addition to our healthcare team. Without their expertise, our patients would be missing a very large piece of the healthcare pie. So our RDs are effective in what they do and highly valued by patients, providers, and care teams, and then local and upper level leadership as well. Next slide. And now we'll look at self-management and how our RDs have helped impact these measures. Next slide. So diabetes self-management measures were required for patient-centered medical home accreditation and RDs were part of the clinic implementation te teams and it made sense uh, for us to take on self-management as the nutrition experts and also trained in motivational interviewing. Um, our accessible model meant easy referrals uh, and we used a population approach identifying patients through the diabetes registry and then we monitor data to show completion of different self-management measures by clinic. And though self-management um, is not itself a health, a health outcome, uh, research demonstrates that self-management education is associated with improved health outcomes for patients with type 2 diabetes. And next slide. So this data demonstrates one example of dietitian impact on self-management goals in our organization. So we're looking at Yakima Medical, for example, which is um, one of our largest clinics. At the time of our initial self-management efforts as part of PCMH accreditation, Yakima Medical had a part-time RD. So we can see that self-management assessment completion rate was only 15% in October of 2013. So we were far from our goal of at least 50%. Once we increased the dietitian to full-time in November, we see the self-management completion rate increased to 50% by December of 2013. And then with improvements in workflow, we were able to exceed our goal and reach 73% completion rate by March of 2014. So this trend was apparent across other clinics, which increased RDFTE. Next slide. And this slide is showing the percent of completed self-managements done by the RD. They're the ones um, circled, and that's compared to other staff at their respective clinics. And we can see that the majority of our RDs complete 90 to 100 percent of all the self-management uh, visits for diabetes at their clinics. Next slide. And this is some interesting data. We found that approximately 60 percent of patients coming into our clinics on any given day have a nutrition-related diagnosis. Uh, on average, this means about 60 patients a day at our larger clinics. It could be 90 to 150 patients a day. Um, and this isn't even accurately counting um, overweight and obesity, as many don't actually have that diagnosis, even though they do have the elevated BMI. Um, and looking at just type 2 diabetes, approximately one in five patients coming into our clinics have type 2 diabetes. If we include prediabetes and gestational diabetes, we're looking at more like 30% of patients coming in with some diabetes diagnosis. Next slide. So the next steps for our program are to demonstrate improvements in diabetes health measures like hemoglobin A1C and blood pressure. 
And as we discussed before, we know we're moving these measures and have anecdotal evidence. So our next step is to really capture that with data. And then another new effort is formalizing protocols and workflows for dietitian referrals. This is starting as part of our um, Radical Rosewood pilot project here in Portland. Next slide. And this is an example of formalizing the process of dietitian referrals. So we've moved away from the provider-dependent referrals, um, and now we're mo moving into creating formal protocols and workflows. So what this really means is that fewer patients fall through the cracks, and we're able to reach um, as many patients as we can. Um, and we're also an established member of the care team that other disciplines rely on. Next slide. And you can advance one more, Akira. So why include RDs? Medical nutrition therapy provided by an RD as part of the healthcare team has been uh, shown to, to do the following um, things listed there that you can all read later. We'll go ahead and move on. So less than 45% of primary care visits by adults with these chronic conditions include diet counseling, and only 30% of visits include physical activity counseling. Next slide. So why does this happen? Providers don't have enough time uh, or the time needed um, to provide preventative services, behavioral counseling, and disease management support. Um, acute concerns often crowd out chronic care management. And physicians also have poor self-efficacy and lack of training in behavior change. About a quarter feel very effective in their counseling of exercise, diet, and weight reduction. And this is really where dietitians can play a strong role. Next slide. And to finish, um, one of our clinic directors at Pharma uh, Yakima Valley Pharmacers Clinic was going to um, say just a couple words about our program uh, from the clinic administrator perspective. Hey, it's Michelle um, from Rosewood. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can okay. hear you. Okay. Um, so I won't be long because I know we're at time, but um, I would just say that um, integrated services are really, really effective, I found, in FQHCs. And so having an integrated um, dietitian on staff just makes this whole um, this whole issue a lot easier to deal with um, in terms of diabetes and nutrition and other um, key services. So I think that's just kind of my comment. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and you can move on to the next slide, Akira. We just have more patient quotes, but uh, we're finished. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so sorry, my apologies to everybody for kind of having to rush through all of that, but I think that was some great information that hopefully can be taken back to the clinic. Um, a couple questions did come through. Um, Mosaic Medical is wondering for Aaron Kirk, if they can get some details about how you're segmenting the population. Um, and so I don't know if you want to send that to me and I could send it on to them or connect you guys, but that would be one question that we had. Yeah, sounds good. I can uh, gather up something and send that off. It'll take a little bit. Sure. Great. Um, and then the next question that came through was from Benton County. And um, they were asking whether to, and this is, goes to Yakima Valley, um, are the RD visits billable or are you at a cap capitated rate? Uh, yes, we're not billing for our services. OK, great. Are there any other quick questions before we end the call? And feel free to um, send any questions my way, and we can go ahead and filter those through as needed. Um, one quick thing is that the expert screen guide is now available on our data transparency website. So thank you so much to all the clinics who participated in this. Um, and the webinar slides and recording for this presentation, again, will be available on that same website. And we'll send you a follow-up email um, with a survey link. So if you have a few moments, please take the survey and let us know 
what you saw as a call and how we can um, improve future calls. Uh, so thanks so much, everyone. Have a good day.